Thank you. Welcome to Florida, everybody. Uh, before I present, I want to just echo something that Michael Oso said to you, which is if you are not a member of the CCFA, please join. This is your time. You'll get it back in spades in terms of the benefits the organization provides to you and to your patients, and I really think it's important, and I hope that you will. I'm talking about something that for many in this room is a topic that you may know very little about, and for that, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to try and introduce this to our colleagues and to teach you a little bit about biosimilars. What are they and why should we care? I think you know why we should care, because they're coming. They're already in Europe and Asia extensively, and we should know about them because they will influence our practice. So let me start by reminding you that the distinction between biological therapies and small molecules uh, are important to know. On the one hand, small molecules can represent simple structures where identical copies can be made and where we can talk about such things as generics, which can be identical. Uh, they generally are more stable, and they don't usually cause any type of immune reaction in our bodies. Biological therapies are both hormones, growth factors, and monoclonal antibodies. And of course, in our field, we talk mostly about monoclonal antibodies. These are highly complex. They're difficult to replicate. You can't make identical copies. And really, the process in developing them is what determines how they look and how they work. And there are many more sophisticated tests and regulatory requirements in order to prove that such therapies are effective. And of course, as this audience well knows, they have a much higher immunogenic potential, meaning they can stimulate an immune response in our bodies, which we know leads to decreased response to those therapies. The process really determines the product, and this gets at why it's so complex, first to develop an originator biological therapy, and secondly, to develop biosimilars, which is that you have to go through an orderly development of the product and recognize that at each step, there may be something that changes that could result in a functional or dysfunctional protein. And this brings you back probably to biochemistry class when you were younger. So what is a biosimilar? The FDA defines it as a biological product that is highly similar to a reference product, notwithstanding minor differences in clinically inactive components. There's no clinically meaningful differences in terms of safety, purity, and potency. The term interchangeable, which you should know, refers to the designation of biosimilars that allows for free exchange with the originator biologics with no greater risk of adverse effects or diminished efficacy. At least that's what we would expect. This could allow pharmacy substitution of a biosimilar for an originator, or vice versa, without a prescriber intervention. And that's one of the things that you need to know a little bit about and what we need to be understanding further in our field. This is also subject to each state's laws and regulations governing drug substitution. So while the FDA may have something to say about whether the agent is available for certain indications, the state determines how the actual distribution and prescription and interchangeability may occur. And I will come back to that in a moment. The FDA provides guidance, and this is the answer to your pretest question, so pay attention, in the following ways. The biosimilar data requirement is an abbreviated approval pathway. It's not the same as bringing an originator or a novel uh, mechanism to market. It's weighted reliance on analytical similarity, which means that primarily the amino acid structure is expected to be the same, and the other checklist that the FDA provides is met in other specific functional ways. Clinical trials are not required, but at least one comparative study in a uh, approved indication for the originator drug is required. No phase two dose ranging studies are needed, and the indication may allow extrapolation with scientific justification. In other words, uh, the proof that it may work similarly in another disease state can be extrapolated to a different disease state. So for example, related to all of us, if a biosimilar shows equivalent efficacy and safety in rheumatoid arthritis, extrapolation would allow it to then be applied to Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Biosimilars are not generics. I would encourage you to avoid using that term, even when you describe it to patients. And there are some significant differences. I've mentioned already to you the difference between small molecules and the concept of generics and biological therapies and the concepts of bio biosimilars. The point here, though, is to recognize that there must be pharmacovigilance of biosimilars, just like generics, after the drug is brought to market. 
There's another term you may not have heard of, but I wanted to clarify, and that's a term called biobetter. A biobetter is not a biosimilar. This actually has modifications to the originator biologic therapy, and they are sometimes called biosuperiors because the modification is supposed to enhance its efficacy or its safety profile. These are not regulated um, and do not have uh, recognition in any specific way because they're considered new drugs. So a biobetter or biosuperior would have to go through the entire usual pathway of regulatory approval before such a product can come to the market. So what's in the pipeline? Let me start by telling you that there is a biosimilar in the U.S. that came to market earlier this year. This was the first biosimilar in the U.S. market, and this was for uh, the equivalent to Nupagen or GCSF. Uh, this obviously is not something for IBD, but I wanted to mention to you that we do have a precedent for a biosimilar coming to the U.S. market. If you look down the list here, it's quite extensive. You might be surprised to know that there are over 650 biosimilars in development, and nearly 50% of them are in preclinical trial stages. It takes quite a long time to uh, develop such and a lot of money to bring them to market, as you might fully expect. If you look at the list of uh, products or product classes down the table here, you can see that the top two listed there in terms of U.S. sales as well as the number of biosimilars and biobetters that are in development are both adalimumab or Humira and infliximab or Remicade. Looking around the world, you can see that actually there are quite a few uh, biosimilars that are in development in the U.S. There are a number that are already available and had been developed in Asia and in Europe, and we're learning more about those experiences. And you can see some other countries represented here as well. Getting back to the issue that states have the jurisdiction over whether or not interchangeability is allowed, you can see here your state and whether or not they currently have a law that will help regulate whether substitution is allowed, what communication to prescribers is necessary, and whether or not patients need to be informed as well that their therapy that they've been on for a while is being substituted for a biosimilar, or vice versa. When looking at the available literature in our world, there are a number of not fully published studies. These are all abstracts or have been presented at national or international meetings looking at uh, the available safety and efficacy data for some biosimilars, both for infliximab and less available but available data for adalimumab. And you can see whether we look at the Hungarian experience, which is essentially open label and describing efficacy that we might think is similar but without comparative arms. Uh, the DDW symposium uh, from the Norway experience and a much larger trial that's still underway there, looking at induction of biosimilars and the benefits there. A Polish experience looking in kids with Crohn's disease. Uh, the Korean experience looking at both Crohn's and UC. And of note is the Murphy experience from Ireland, which actually showed that the patients who received Inflectra, biosimilar infliximab, did worse than those who were receiving infliximab. This was not randomized. This was an uh, open-label description of different patients who received one therapy or the other. And so you might understand, given the small number, some limitations in interpreting such a study. So what are the issues? I think I've outlined some of them for you. The first one would be the risk of non-medical switching, which means the patient's stable doing well and the therapy is switched on them or on you. And what might happen to those patients? This could be nothing if the biosimilar has the same efficacy and safety profile as the originator therapy. Uh, but it could also be bad if there are unknown uh, potential changes in how patients respond or the logistical hurdle that we all deal with, which is the delay of getting a new therapy. So if a pharmaceutical uh, agent is available and an insurance company says that we prefer this agent over the one they're receiving, we all know about the unexpected delays that occur in switching a patient from one therapy to the other, which may have nothing to do with whether the drug itself is good or bad. There's also confusion regarding names and branding. So one drug is called infliximab generic, one is called Inflectra, you can see Remsema versus Remicade, you get the idea here and it can be quite confusing for all of us. There's also the important issue of understanding immunogenicity or cross-reactivity. Something we haven't needed to be as aware of in our field is that if a patient develops anti-drug antibodies to one of our current biological agents, if we stay within class, what we've known or at least appreciated has been that anti-drug antibodies do not cross-react across drugs within the class. 
But by design, we expect that to be the case with biosimilars, meaning if you have antibodies to infliximab and you go to a biosimilar to Remicade, you're likely to have the same problem as you had before. So this adds a new level of complexity to thinking about when you cycle or switch patients uh, to other therapies after loss of response. And then there are many unknowns that we'd like to figure out in our field related to these agents. There's limited data to guide us otherwise, and this is almost like comparing apples and oranges, and I consider not showing it. But we do have the elective experience of switching stable patients from infliximab to adalimumab, a trial that was cut short because so many patients relapsed when they went to adalimumab after being on infliximab. This isn't the same thing as saying going from a, a infliximab to a biosimilar infliximab. Nonetheless, it demonstrates one potential problem we might run into if we allowed patients to be switched from one therapy to another when they're stable. And there's been some additional claims data now looking at what's called non-medical switching. Again, the general concept of patients who are stable, and this is across all indications for anti-TNF therapies, who are switched from one agent to another. And it demonstrated, uh, and this uh, presented at ECHO and a variant of it at DDW, that the patients who had non-medical switching were more likely to have problems both 30 days as well as 90 days and even in one year follow-up. So we have to be thoughtful and careful about when we electively adjust therapies. And it feeds, I think, nicely into Jean-Fred's presentation right before me. The Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America has a statement on biosimilars, and I'm going to end by summarizing that for you. The statement first focuses on safety and effectiveness, and the CCFA has taken the position that the FDA should ensure that all biologics and biosimilars undergo thorough human testing and meet the highest safety standards. When considering interchangeability, the CCFA says the FDA should provide reasonable proof that switching would not incur immunogenicity or loss of response to the innovator, or sometimes called the originator, and vice versa. The risk of cross-reactivity and immunogenicity of antidrug antibodies from the innovator or originator agent to the biosimilar must be clearly understood, defined, and listed on the label and prescribing information. That's that new point about safety for you, for your patient who develops antidrug antibodies. Each biosimilar should have a unique identification number, name, or else use international non-proprietary name standards to eliminate patient and provider confusion. Notice that the CCFA has not taken the position that we need to do new randomized placebo-controlled trials with biosimilars in our patient population. That's distinct from some other uh, agencies around the country, I'm sorry, around the world, in particular Europe. And the second part of the position statement for the CCFA is about shared decision-making and transparency. The prescribing provider should be notified prior to the substitution of the innovator agent with a biosimilar, and the prescriber should be able to prevent substitution by indicating dispense as written or brand medically necessary. And for those who want to read more about this, it's available on the CCFA's wonderful website. So with that, I'll end with a generic, not a biosimilar joke. Uh, in which the patient's waiting for his therapy but is given instead a suppository, which he's told is now a generic. And I want to thank you all and wish you a good meeting.